is a, is a hard act to follow. Yeah, he did this for a long time. So uh, let's get an official roll call of who is all here on the commission. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, Commissioner Ariaga. Present. Commissioner Mayer. Present. Commissioner Freitas. You can always saw her earlier. Dilo, are you still there? Um, did you say me? I said Dilo. Yes, I'm here, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Benson. Here. And uh, Commissioner Lazar. Here. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Commissioner Lazar. <laughs> thank you. Good to be here. Good to have you. So um, as to we're going to go with a salute to the flag. Uh, Jessica, can you bring that up or do you have? Um, and it's really kind of hard with the voices and the feedback. So let's try to get through this as gracefully as possible. <laughs> um, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. So I believe an election of officers is in order for tonight. Madam Vice Chair, sorry. Um, I believe we need to do the oath of office before we can do the election. Okay, sounds good. And this one's also a super challenging thing. Normally it's, you know, uh, repeat after me. Um, Commissioner Lazar, do you have a copy of your oath of office in front of you as well? Um, I haven't been provided it. So no, I was looking forward to receiving one. Okay, I definitely have one. So it'll be kind of um, a repeat after me situation that is hopefully not a, a big delay. So if you can raise your right hand, please. Um, Tiana, before you keep going, you yes. can make it easier. Just when you get to the name part, have him say his name. You read the rest of it and have him say I do at the end. He doesn't have to repeat you. Even easier. Thank you. So, um, Steve, just to start us off, say I, Stephen Lazar. I, Stephen Lazar. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of California, and the Charter of the City of Eureka, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter in the capacity of a member of the Planning Commission for the City of Eureka. Do you take this oath? I do so swear. Thank you, Commissioner Lazar, and welcome to us. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> welcome aboard. <laughs> Um, Commissioner Ariaga, will you, will you, we've had a lot of change. Can you just announce for us who the commissioners are just for the public to just make it clear? Uh, definitely. So for the public, I'm Commissioner Ariaga. And then actually, how about we all introduce ourselves? <laughs> so go ahead, Commissioner Benson. I'm Commissioner Benson. Commissioner Mayor. I guess I'll go next. Uh, my name is Dilo or Dolores Freitas, and I was just appointed last month. So, Steve, I only need you by one evening. Thanks, Dilo. Uh, I'm Steve Lazar, and I think we all just saw me <laughs> take the office right now. So, Looking forward to it. Yeah, fairly new commission. So I'm really excited to, to get to know you all and uh, to get in the swing of things. Obviously, I'm really new at even leading mission uh, um, agendas and things and whatnot and leading our missions here. So <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, 
but and in following suit, now I believe that we can have our election of officers, uh, correct staff? That's correct, yes. Awesome. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, do we have to do the chair first or vice chair? You may choose to do it in what order, whatever order you like. Okay. Um, I have a recommendation for vice chair. Um, and I would like to recommend uh, Meredith Mayer for vice chair. I would be totally comfortable to second that. You guys have been on longest. Um, and I would also put you forward to continue as chair if you're willing. There you go. Um, I will second Tiana staying, moving up to chair. Um, I accept that. So, <laughs> um, uh, Meredith, would you accept um, also the role as vice chair? Yes. Or is that okay. So now we can vote on it officially, correct staff? Is there anybody else that wants to be in the running just to study the waters here? <laughs> Dodge that bullet. <laughs> yeah, I'm not either, to be clear. <laughs> okay. Okay, well then, if uh, no one else wants to throw their name in the running, um, Let's have a vote for Meredith Mayer being vice chair. Aye. It's one. Aye. Aye as well. Aye. No nays, all ayes. <laughs> so Meredith Mayer, you are officially the Eureka Planning Commission's vice chair. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and congratulations. And uh, so for <laughs> for the next, uh, we can have a round of votes for uh, chair. Aye. 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 Well, and I guess I'm officially the chair of the Eureka Planning Commission. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Bull. Yeah. I appreciate appreciate all of you, and hopefully this isn't so painful. <laughs> like I said, I'm getting used to things. So, um, with that behind us, then we go into approval of minutes for the previous uh, meeting. I don't know. I hope hopefully you guys had a chance to take a look at um, the agenda and look over the meeting uh, notes. And if anybody has anything to say on that. I did have a chance to look it over. It looks um, fine. I did notice that at the very end, I had requested um, a report on the annual goal setting, and that didn't seem to make it through on the minutes. Um, but I don't know if it really belongs there. If that's too much detail. So I would defer to staff on that. We can certainly add that if the commission would like. Well, just to get a motion on the floor, um, this is Commissioner Benson. Um, I'll, I'll uh, propose a motion to accept the minutes of, of last month um, with the um, uh, with the comments um, from uh, Commissioner Freitas. I would second. I'd like to abstain from this vote since I wasn't at the meeting and don't feel like you need me for the vote. So, okay. Well, um, let's just go with another roundhouse vote of who's left. Um, I approve this. I approve. I. I was not present at the last meeting, so I also need to abstain. Do we have a quorum with three staff? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. 
So, and, and then, yeah, I, I definitely recommend, uh, you know, everyone, just even if you weren't here, obviously for the last meeting, but if you get a chance just to go over the, the last meeting notes and just kind of see the flow, um, I'm still new, even though I've been here for a minute, I'm still new, I still feel new. So there's gonna be questions and thing that, things that pop up. So please feel free to interject or ask questions, you know, for us or for staff. Um, as we're getting more into the groove of this, you know, just facilitates better learning. And I think all around better dialogue, you know, for transparency and efficiency. So there are no bad questions around here. Um, oral communications, nothing here on anything for us staff, no? We had nobody who asked to speak during oral communications. We do have a couple who asked to speak for later projects. Okay, great. I'd like to just take the opportunity to welcome everyone to the Planning Commission. I'm also a new person appointed in January, but asked to defer my start till this meeting tonight. And so I'm really starting uh, in earnest tonight as well. It's um, really kind of cool to see some new faces, you know, and I just think it's pretty awesome that you can get a group of strangers together in this sort of space and, you know, create some change and create what, you know, we like to see within the city that we love so much. So it's just really cool to see everyone here. I'm super thankful to be a part of it with you all. So uh, moving on to public hearings. And it seems like there's no continued public hearings, um, but we do have some new public hearings on, on the docket. Um, and unless anything's changed, this would be uh, A, from the meeting agenda, the SC zone metal shipping container, um, container text amendment, correct staff? That is correct, yes. Okay, so for this one, um, fellow commissioners, I do have to recuse myself from this process as it, um, I'm, I am linked to this group. So Meredith Mayer is gonna lead you through this one. <laughs> Well, I think uh, staff can give the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, one moment. I said Madam Mayor, sorry. Commissioner Mayor. Probably won't be the last time that happens. <laughs> It'd be an easy mistake to make. All right, so this is the SC zone, Service Commercial Zone, Metal Shipping Container Text Amendment. And the project number is TA-21-0001. And Papa and Barkley has applied to amend the zoning code to allow metal shipping containers or Connex boxes to be used for permanent outdoor storage in the inland SC Service Commercial Zone District. The inland SC zone is primarily located along the east side of Broadway from the Papa and Barclay site at the gateway to Eureka up to West Washington Street near the north end of Broadway. And there's one small parcel at the corner of Myrtle and West that is zoned SC. The zoning code currently allows metal shipping containers in the SC zone on a temporary basis not to exceed 30 days. Staff is proposing and the applicant has agreed with the addition of language to Eureka Municipal Code section 15530.110 outdoor storage. Subparagraph F will be changed to allow metal shipping containers as outdoor storage in the SC zone district provided the containers are located behind the primary structure whenever possible, or if it's not physically impossible, or physically possible, excuse me, then um, the containers would need to be located as close to the rear of the property as possible. Containers cannot be located between the area between the building and front or exterior side property line and the Connex box must be painted to match or complement the primary structure on the site. The use table for mixed use zone districts will also be updated and we'll add a reference to the outdoor storage. 
non-retail line and reference to the outdoor storage code section. We'll also add a footnote that metal shipping containers used for permanent outdoor storage are principally permitted if they comply with the standards in the outdoor storage section. Otherwise, it'll be a conditionally permitted use and requires a minor use permit. And on your screen, I have for you, whenever you're ready, a suggested motion. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. And the applicant is with us uh, in the meeting tonight. Does anyone have questions for staff? I have none. I think Stephen raised uh, his hand. Yes. Yeah, just uh, I, I was interested. It seemed like this was precipitated by Pop, Pop and Barkley. Uh, is there been other interest, uh, Kristen, uh, in metal shipping containers that you've heard uh, from other folks with, throughout the city? There has not. At least not on the inland side. That was my only question. Principal Planner, um, here's my question. What what problem is being fixed here? Can you just can you make that more plain to the commission? What I'm hearing is the 30 day limit. So there's a time constraint that's being fixed here. What other things are being made easier or supporting businesses or costs? Can you talk a little bit more to that? So the text amendment itself, as you mentioned, is um, changing the, the text amendment is allowing permanent use of Connex or shipping containers in the CSO district for storage. They're not currently allowed permanently. They can be allowed for 30 days on a temporary basis at this point in time. So that would be the advantage is that uh, businesses could then install a shipping container provided it can meet all the um, the conditions in the code and then they would be able to use that without having to either remove the shipping container every 30 days and then replace it or um, be in violation of the code okay well, i guess the opposite question of what problem is being fixed is what problems are being created by having shipping containers be have a permanent status in, in your mind? I don't think that there are any uh, problems that are gonna be created. It, it really is no different than if they built a new building on their site. I mean, they could build a, a stick built storage shed um, and that would not be subject to the 30 day time frame. Uh, it's just the shipping containers, I think, were probably excluded originally as permanent use because of the aesthetics or the potential for aesthetics for them. But I think with the conditions that we've added um, that there should be no issues uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. Okay, thank you. That answered my questions. I have a number of comments, but I think that would be after the motion. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think next is public comment. Um, so uh, I'm Michael Kraft with Pop and Barkley. I'll just talk uh, briefly about what uh, problems this addresses for us. Um, so we're talking about the former Kmart building at the south end of town. And in the last eight months, we put about 10,000 square feet of new uses into that building. And so uh, we had kind of a luxurious storage situation there, but we can see it going away. Um, and so we'll need some kind of permanent fix going forward. Uh, this would be our preferred one. Um, obviously we could potentially lease space somewhere else and have our box truck running back and forth across town, making transfers and, and that kind of thing. Um, but we have uh, activated about 3,000 square feet of retail space. We put in about 2,000 square feet of freezer and cooler space, uh, about 1,600 feet of a uh, chocolate production room. And so chunk by chunk, we're using up this building in very good ways. Um, 
beautiful thing about shipping containers is they're so climate controlled. So we did look into some less expensive building approaches like a metal building perhaps, but uh, to get the level of climate control that we want to have for things like cardboard packaging that can uh, get ruined pretty quickly, uh, these shipping containers work rather well. Um, and so our narrow interest is in getting that done and in putting the shipping containers behind the structure. Uh, so it's about, you know, several hundred square feet from the 101 corridor behind that big building. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say. I'm happy to answer questions uh, directed to me if there are any, um, but I will uh, kick it back to you guys. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Kraft? Uh, no specific questions other than um, thank you for doing business in the city of Eureka and for bringing this forward for our consideration. It looks like Stephen might have a question there, Commissioner Lazar. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kraft, this is for Mr. Kraft. Uh, the, the shipping containers, are you envisioning these being a permanent, um, I mean, or semi-permanent uh, piece of infrastructure, or would there be potentially a rotation of sorts where it was brought onto the site by somebody that you do business with, um, right? You deal with the extraction industry. So obviously there's deliveries and distribution points that occur. Um, are you envisioning it more like a commercial coach that is a sort of way of getting a commercial space in place without building a stick built structure, but achieving the same goal? Uh, I think it's fair to say we would see them at least as semi-permanent um, and the uh, alternate use that you described with people coming going, um, that that's not part of this. Uh, we've got a pretty busy uh, shipping and receiving area um, that is one of those uses in the in the main building. Um, so uh, I guess the answer is yes. So just to follow up, it's, it sounds like this is a way of kind of creating additional space for the problem you're seeing, you're forecasting in terms of occupying, reoccupying the Kramer building without expanding the footprint of the building, but doing it in a more modular um, kind of discrete way with, with kind of auxiliary storage. Correct. Okay. I guess I would just comment that I see this as an asset beyond this particular business because we as a city are trying to court this type of industry and trying to augment existing structures can be problematic versus starting from a, you know, established uh, built to suit uh, type of thing that, you know, like modular homes, these are expected for compliance when they roll off the line. So I do see this as being beneficial beyond the scope of this particular applicant. That's all. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to make a motion? Just for the record, Madam Vice Chair, we did not have anybody else who asked to speak on this item. So you could go ahead and close the public hearing if you're ready. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing. I um, agree with what Commissioner Lazar said, and I also agree with Principal Planner Getz's um, report and analysis that the only real concern uh, would likely be aesthetics, but on the whole, it would be beneficial for businesses. And I do think as it is conditioned, uh, it will give some flexibility as well for the shipping containers to be placed behind buildings and out of sight. But if there is uh, you know, an issue with not being able to place it behind the building, then they have the flexibility to work with staff to find a solution as opposed to having to either have that outright denied or go through another process to get to get that uh, undertaken. I personally feel comfortable with it. Um, so unless there's further discussion, I'm happy to make the motion. Yeah, I think what you're saying is really true. Also, they're easily moved. So um, a building can fluctuate if there was traffic issues or those kinds of things on the backside. They're, they're easy to move around, which makes them really flexible. I have a number of comments and I was 
going to wait for the motion, but I but it seems like we're in conversation about it um, pre motion. So I guess I'll just um, speak. Um, I I like I'm I'm in support of the motion in that it it seems to create ease for businesses. It seems to support businesses. It seems to be low cost. It seems to be portable. Um, it seems to be an adaptive reuse of Connex boxes. And in my reading of the general plan for service commercial, the SC zone, that includes office, I'm just gonna read it, retail, office, restaurants, lodging, entertainment, outdoor sales, storage, warehousing, and limited residential. So storage is, is one of the purposes of, of that service um, uh, of, of the SC zone. My, my concerns are, are visual, you know, uh, just a, a downgrade to the visual quality of the commercial corridor, um, an, an eyesore in, in a sense. I appreciate that that um, that uh, that um, principal planner gets us is has specified as a condition of approval is that is that it be painted to be like the building so we don't have sort of these multicolored, um, you know, freight freight connex boxes. Um, I'm a little concerned about. Uh, uh, that some of the SC zones are on the edge of open space. So seeing them from, for, for example, Palco Marsh um, and the Eureka Waterfront Trail, which abuts against the SC zone um, is uh, again, sort of that, that downgrade of the visual quality of what we're trying to make sort of a jewel of, of the city of Eureka with the waterfront trail. And it seems, um, I'm, I didn't, and, I, and I'm not, I'd like to see something in the, in there about, you know, obviously not, it, it not being allowed to store any kind of hazardous materials at all because of tsunami and earthquake mobility of those. So I would, I would move to, to have the Planning Commission adopt a resolution um, that might make, uh, might make this a semi-permanent rather than a permanent um, uh, uh, approval. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about 30 years from now, <laughs> you know, people, us having a lot of these boxes because we've made this possible tonight. And, um, and in this particular case of, of Kmart, uh, it's, it's, it's a reasonable request, but I, I'm, I'm just a little bit hesitant to use that word permanent and would like to see a more semi-permanent status, something way beyond three months because that's just unreasonable, but maybe something like a, 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 you know, a year that, and then it can be it can be re, re um, just with without having to go through the planning commission be um, you know re um, affirmed you know on a, on an annual basis but but it'd be nice to not create a, a city of, of sort of Lego building blocks of connex containers um, with our action tonight it'd be nice to have some limitation to that and I'm open to what that might look like from any other other commissioners that's the that's the total of my comments on this. Madam Vice Chair, may I clarify a point? Yes, please do. Yes. Commissioner Benson um, expressed concern regarding um, these being visible from the waterfront trail and also mentioned um, tsunami, um, potential tsunami issues. I just wanted to clarify that the um, SC zone district is on the east side of Broadway. So I don't believe there's really any place that you're going to be able to see the Connex box, or it's less than likely you would be able to see it from the waterfront, um, uh, from the, sorry, from the waterfront trail. Um, you might in some location be able to look across Broadway and see it from the trail, but I, I think the likelihood that that would happen is uh, rather low. Likewise, um, Tsunami inundation, well, some places, yes, it might go all the way across Broadway. Again, I think that that's um, less than likely. Thank Principal you for, for that clarification. Further point of clarification, I wanted to ask you, I know that there are some screening provisions in other places uh, in the code as well that would still apply in addition to this new language that is now being created. Is that correct? Can you verify what other what other restrictions there would be related to aesthetics? Uh, yes, there. The potential there is for um, screening, either fencing or landscaping, to be required depending on exactly where it's located on the site.
So to be clear, uh, Commissioner Benson, were you trying to make a motion about um, a, an I edit? Think, or I, I, were you trying to take a temperature? Think, I think I will, um, you know, try that. I haven't wordsmithed it very well um, yet, um, but I, I guess I'll just see if it comes. Okay, I move the Planning Commission adopt a resolution making the findings required to approve a text amendment. And I further move we forward a recommendation to the City Council to adopt the text amendment to allow metal shipping, shipping containers for semi-permanent outdoor storage um, and non-hazardous materials use in the SC Service Commercial Zone District. And I think as discussion here. I think we need a second to even discuss it, but I made the change from permanent to semi-permanent and I added non-hazardous materials to the existing language. I'd be happy to second for the purposes of discussion. All right, we have a second. Let's open it up for discussion for the commission. I'll say I I'm okay with it being permanent. I think it's um, a little cumbersome on the business to have to get a yearly permit. Just one more thing for businesses to have to remember one more thing for the city to perhaps send out, have to send out notices. And I think uh, the eyesore portion of that is being dealt with um, in this resolution already. Um, but I, I, I could see the hazardous materials perhaps being an issue, but um, again, they're not any less secure than a, a building. So I'm not sure that it would come in to play here. Uh, just to respond to that, my, you know, they are, they're not anchored to the ground. So, so seismically, and if we hit any of the moderate, we're really having this conservative estimate of sea level rise where there's two other scenarios out there that, that again, that word permanence comes to mind. Um, I, I would like the city to be able to ask people to move them if we end up in a different kind of seismic or, or sea level rise um, condition than we are currently um, you know, forecasting. Um, and, and, I, and I agree, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Mayor, that, that you know, a year is, is probably unreasonable. I'm, I'm, what, what's five, how about five years? You know, I mean, just, just something that isn't permanent where we're saying those can be there in perpetuity no matter what changes in the city, people will have the right to have these temporary Connex shipping containers as storage, um, as you know, as their main as their main storage. And there could be a promulgation of that might, might not be in the best interest of, of the city compared to permanent buildings. That's that's all I'm trying to say here. And even if it's every ten years, but just not permanent, is where I'm going with this. I think it's a, what you're saying is a valid point. I, I hear that, but I think, you know, a, a further year five is probably more reasonable. 10, I, yeah, a lot can change in 10 years, but. Matt, excuse me, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. I believe that the building code actually requires these to be permanently affixed to the ground. So they're either gonna have to be installed on a foundation or otherwise locked to the ground. So, um, that may make it a little more challenging for businesses to remove them. You said you believe, but do you know that for sure? Or would you need to check on that? So I know for sure that the um, shipping containers that were installed down on Coast Seafoods property on the waterfront, um, those were required to be permanently affixed to the ground. And I believe that that would still apply here. It is lovely to have staff and all the information they bring. Thank you, um, because I'm making assumptions from what I've seen around town. I haven't seen them affixed to the ground. So, um, and maybe maybe that, um, and so maybe we we make that plain tonight that they that they be if that they be if affixed to the ground. A comment I'd like to make too is I uh, mostly agree with Commissioner Mayer and it would be challenging for businesses 
and also I believe for staff um, in terms of enforcement for whether or not hazardous materials are located in a box, I have no idea how that would be enforced um, or on what sort of schedule. I would uh, prefer to not include that just because I believe it would be challenging to enforce in practice. Understood. The, the reason I'm including that is it was based on the assumption of their mobility in an earthquake and spillage that could happen. That's why I, I put that in there. Would you like to edit your motion to come back at it or do we need to go to a vote on this motion for him to have to edit that? If my, he so my understanding to. is that we can edit it as we as we go and some of the other comments can be you know uh, conditions that aren't necessarily part of the part of the, the motion if i understand this correctly that would be correct yes um okay i'm willing to to just uh, uh to change it just to keep semi-permanent in, but take out the piece about non-hazardous waste. If, if in fact they have to be affixed to the ground. It just, uh, it, it seems to me that, that that's having to affix it to the ground is adding a burden to business owners. So that part of portability and, and supporting businesses by giving them sort of an adaptive reuse of something when you have to fix it to the ground and suddenly that's a lot more effort time and money um, to basically get a get a quick storage container. I would second your edit with semi permanence. Do we need to be specific in what that length would be? No, I think, I think we, that we should we should include some direction to the council as far as our idea of what that would mean. Otherwise, it would be hard. It would be difficult for them to divine. I agree. And I, okay. and I, I would just offer. I think so. A couple things. Uh, I think we probably have some examples of some shipping containers that are outlive their thirty day period. That may be making us think that they're not required to be anchored. Um, we've seen them emerge in the county for cannabis farms as a way of providing a secure location for materials and equipment. And I'm fairly certain they're always required to be anchored where we permit them. Um, in the sense that when getting to the permanent part of it, I'm, I'm glad uh, Commissioner Benson brought that up. I didn't really think of that, but that is something that could outlive its usefulness. And I think we have an analog on the North Spit with the coastal dependent industrial lands that are being reused with caveats that interim uses can only live there for 10 years at a maximum and they have to be renewed after that through a use permit process. I don't know that we have to go that far, but I think the idea is a shipping container is great as a start as a way to solve a short-term problem, but in terms of overall investment, if a business begins to kind of realize this is a necessary piece of their infrastructure, it would be appropriate to make that extension into a more uh, conventional and permanent investment in a building of some sort. So I think that's kind of the point is like, where's the, where's the fine piece, but maybe five years is a way to kind of give them an initial realistic period to try it out, but, but also a reminder that they have to revisit that at that juncture. So I'm just throwing that out there. I'd be willing to go even longer if we're going to have a time limit at all, um, maybe 10 years. <laughs> Or maybe staff could, you know, provide some direction on what they think would be a feasible duration based on other examples that they have for similar things already in place with the city. Staff, is it reasonable for us to put a range of five to 10 years and, and add that to the motion? Semi-permanent semi on, on a horizon of, of planning horizon of five to 10 years. You may choose to make whatever recommendation the commission can agree to, to the council. Okay, sorry, um, I didn't so, ask you for the answers um, to non-factual so, questions. So five to 10 years. Um, I, Let me reframe the question. Are there other ordinances that, that are intended to be semi-permanent that have review 
on or the order of five to 10 years? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. The only time that that could potentially happen is if the planning commission approved the use permit and put a time line or a time frame on the use. But that comes from a discretionary process and you know, it would be a condition of approval. So. Can you bring back uh, up the motion? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, can you bring back up the motion? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off either. Finish what you're saying. You know, Fritz Meyer gets one potential um, equivalent that comes to my mind is a Mills Act agreement, which is a 10 year term, at which point it can be re-upped um, and it's sort of an administrative process to do so. But that is kind of different because it's an administrative um, sort of financial agreement and doesn't have anything to do with the use necessarily. So I don't know if we would consider that an equivalent or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Freitas. So I'm going to amend this motion to, to also just get it done. Um, and keeping the language ship metal shipping containers for semi-permanent outdoor storage um, for um, a renewable term of five to 10 years in the SC service commercial zone district. A uh, question for staff. Um, so Kristen, I, I noticed in the footnote in the code here that we're saying that there were principally permitted use for both retail and non-retail. Um, so could it, is that, is, that, is that correct? There would be no discretionary permit trigger for a metal shipping container meeting the performance standards? Correct, as long as they're in compliance with the um, language in section 304-4, or 304.110, which is the part about it being located behind the primary structure and being painted, then it is principally permitted. If it's not going to meet any of those requirements, then they need a minor use permit. So perhaps a way to solve this, uh, commissioners, would be to just say that it would be principally permitted for a period of, say, up to 10 years, and if longer with a use permit or minor use permit, perhaps? Sure, I'm open to any solution that, that meets the intent here um, and that passes muster in terms of um, fitting uh, with, the, with you know, other, other zoning ordinances. Just for clarity, would you like to make that more formal and reread your motion? Sure. Um, Stephen, will you help me out with that language so that I can repeat it, please? Okay. Um, so in the motion where it says to allow metal shipping containers for permanent outdoor storage, we can use your language, semi-permanent outdoor storage in the SC service commercial zoning district. And then I'd say as a principally permitted use when in conformance with uh, 155.304 to 0.110.F, I'm just reading off of the footnote here or and and limited to a period of 10 years or less or with or longer with a minor use permit okay i'm never going to be able to repeat all that so i'm just going to ask that it's <laughs> amended per what the language as as stephen uh, as commissioner lazar just um gave us I'm so gonna... to clarify sorry guys <laughs> <laughs> to clarify that motion that last part Commissioner Lazar would be principally permitted for a period of 10 years, after which point it would need to return before the planning commission for a minor use permit and then could potentially be extended for, you know, a to be determined period of time. Was that the intent of your motion? That's a good question. I guess what I was envisioning is an applicant could choose to secure the minor use permit right off the bat if they knew they wanted this to be there permanently or at least as permanently as they could envision and, and this forgo the, the principally permitted. So either scenario would work. So uh, whether renewing a term of a 10 year approval or, or going 
from the beginning as a longer term. That was the, the minor use permit path. I guess I would ask, does that make sense to you, uh, Principal Planner Getz? <laughs> I believe I understand what the commission is looking for, yes. I'll second your motion. We go to a vote. Ready. <laughs> Could we get a roll call for the vote? Would yeah. That be Make it a bit more orderly. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the internet here, so. <clears throat> Uh, Commissioner Freitas? Aye. Commissioner Benson? Aye. Commissioner Lazar? Yes. I also say yes. So we have four yes votes. Motion carries. Commissioner Ariaga recused. Thank you, commissioners, for working with me on that and uh, collab being collaborative. I, she's back. I'm back. <laughs> I missed you guys. I felt so so alone on Survivor Island. <laughs> It's literally how it feels. I'm <laughs> banished. Um, great work, though. So, staff, just um, is there any update for us um, regarding item B that was removed and re-noticed for June 14th, but the Cook and Callison Alley vacation? Anything that we need to know about now? No, just an explanation. It was put forth as a summary vacation. And um, we very recently learned that it actually needs to go through the general vacation process. So we need to revise that staff report and resolution and get that back to you next month. Um, it will be re-noticed because there's a substantial change to the project. So it's just pulled off the agenda for this evening. Okay, thank you for that. Then moving on to item C, um, Golden State Financial Services Conditional Use Permit and Coastal Development Permit. Take it away, staff. Everyone hear me okay? Good evening. Um, let me share my screen here. Am I showing my proper screen or am I showing my notes like I always do? Can someone proper screen. Okay. Proper screen. Luck of the Irish. Good evening, everybody. I'm here to discuss the uh, Golden State Financial Services uh, Indoor Cannabis Cultivation Use Permit and Coastal Development Permit. Um, they are located over at 1735 Second Street, which is in the lovely Bridge District, uh, approximately a block east of the Samoa Bridge there at the corner of Second and F Street. And site info, uh, let me explain that part. It's an existing metal building, approximately 8,300 square feet total. Uh, it's in an area of light industrial, commercial businesses, and some residential. Um, it's located at Second and F. It's in the service commercial zone district. Uh, the CS, which is the coastal version, not to be confused with the SC, which is the inland version. Um, the general plan land use is general commercial. And a quick project summary. Uh, the applicant proposes to operate an indoor cannabis cultivation facility, which would be 5,000 square feet or less. Uh, indoor cannabis cultivation is included in our cannabis use. Uh, it requires a conditional use permit, which in turn triggers a coastal development permit. Um, and Eureka has the permit jurisdiction on this one. Um, the coastal development permit is not appealable to the Coastal Commission. 
and the use of indoor cultivation is good for the entire parcel if it's approved. A uh, quick summary of findings. The proposed cannabis use is considered a commercial use. Uh, it will not impact coastal resources. It is appropriately located. It meets development standards and it's not a threat to public health or safety. Uh, continuing my statement of summary of findings for further analysis of the findings required by the Eureka Municipal Code to approve the CUP and CBP are in the staff report and all required findings can be made according to staff. Um, I did receive some comments on this one. Um, there was a nice group of concerned citizens um, that came forward and shot me an email and also uh, expressed concerns to the Coastal Commission. Um, and those concerns were primarily to do with odor control, um, fears, and a little bit of waste disposal issue as well. Uh, and then I also talked with uh, Coastal Commission staff, um, Sam Regetic, who brought up uh, the point that um, we were going off of, there's a couple of different code sections that deal with cannabis, uh, one for our inland section and one for our coastal. And there's a slight difference in the definition of the cultivation area between the coastal and inland zone. So she was so kind as to point out we were uh, using the wrong calculation. So I will address that at the end of the presentation here. Um, to deal with the odor control program, um, the applicant, applicant has submitted what staff considers an acceptable odor control plan it's consisting of a system that's gonna maintain negative air pressure uh, 24 seven with air scrubbing via state-of-the-art can Q max fans and can filter carbon filters with pre-filter. Um, and I was able to, the applicant was very quick to provide me with um, a lot of information uh, regarding the technical specifications of their odor control devices, uh, both fans and filters. And I didn't include them in my presentation here, but I did forward them along to the concerned uh, public members. Um, I couldn't include them in our presentation because there was a lot of uh, mucho paperwork. So uh, there was a lot of um, stuff I didn't want to bog down. Um, but basically in our code, uh, the statement uh, that, that is in charge of odor control says something to the effect of no odor shall be detectable outside the walls of the facility. And the City of Eureka Cannabis Permit Program requires all cannabis operations to have a, a robust odor control uh, in place. And odor control is a complaint-driven nuisance that the city takes very seriously and we've had to enforce in the past. Um, continuing, uh, just for an example, there were two other existing indoor cultivation sites in the same neighborhood. And one of them has been our longest operational indoor cultivation site. And um, we've had no odor control complaints in the neighborhood. So uh, this is uh, kind of how we're hoping people do things. Um, as far as uh, there was a, a, also a complaint about, or just a, a concern wondering what kind of waste management plan is, uh, is in place. And uh, the applicant provided that all waste will be hauled to fully permitted solid waste landfill and all runoff will go directly into the city wastewater collection system with a, a maximum estimate of 240 gallons per day. And just so you know, the plans were uh, referred to and reviewed by our wastewater staff and uh, they had no comments. So that usually means they're in support. Um, and then the last issue of the square footage calculation, um, the original calculations were based upon canopy area um, when they should have been based upon gross floor area of the cultivation room. Um, so the applicant uh, was able to revise the plans very quickly and bring the total gross floor area under 5,000 square feet uh, by a combination of removing a bedroom that they had planned to use and then adjusting uh, the size of their proposed cultivation room. So here was the original plan. And the lower right, you can see a bedroom that is no longer gonna be part of the project. 
Um, and then they did some slight modifications to their cultivation rooms to bring them uh, down to that 5,000 square foot target. Um, so the square footage cultivation area, yeah, the bedroom has been repurposed into a storage room. And the newly adjusted cultivation rooms now have gross floor areas of 25, 15, and 24, 59 for a, a gross floor area total of 49.74. So they got close to the 5,000, but they stayed under it. And this is the revised um, layout. And it's hard to detect, but the, the, both the cultivation rooms have been reduced in size and the bedroom has been uh, repurposed into a storage room. And let's see, with that, I have a recommended motion. And I'm available for some questions. And we also have uh, the applicants with us, and uh, they're available for questions as well. Awesome. Thank you, staff. Um, do we, commissioners, do you have any questions for staff at this time? I have one, um, and I want to thank uh, staff for putting together some of the answers to the questions I would have asked <laughs> if they hadn't provided it. Um, could we hear a little bit more about when you've had to force odor, what the situation has been and what staff has done to address it, have the business been come into compliance, has their permit ever been revoked? Um, what would we be looking at if we did receive a complaint? Sure. Um, I have uh, taken over the cannabis program somewhat recently, but in the about approximately year I've been uh, running the program, um, we did have an issue uh, with a, a business located over near um, Costco. Uh, uh, somebody complained and we sent our code enforcement folks over and they also could detect the aroma. Um, so we contacted the permit holder and said, we're gonna take your, you know, we're gonna shut you down unless you uh, can, you know, solve this problem. And they were very responsive and uh, they definitely solved the problem. Um, so that's what I explained to some of the concerned citizens today. We, we have a very um, aware code enforcement unit and they're always driving around and uh, they know where all the cannabis businesses are. So uh, they definitely roll, roll down the windows and give a, a good sniff here and there. Um, so that's the only case that I know of. Um, and we didn't have to shut the, the person down, but um, we were on top of it. And uh, anytime we, we get an app or a, a complaint, we take it very seriously. Perfect, thank you. I have some general um, concerns just on sort of impacts on the character of the city over, over time. I've been on the commission a short amount of time. This is already the second um, uh, grow facility that, that I'm being asked to approve, approve the last one on Jacobs Avenue. But character of the city, I just think about tourism and I think about a, the, the financial impact of, of what's looking to be a, a boom and bust industry. Um, uh, and, and certainly impacts on adjacent businesses and residents. And I certainly read the the two the two letters um, that were forwarded um, from from the the Bridge District Neighborhood Watch and the Red Lion um, Hotel. And so, you know, odor. I guess I'm I'm getting to a question, um, Planner Topolowski, and that's about and that is about odor. And I, and what I'm hearing is that it's complaint driven, and there have not been complaints to some other sites that are adjacent with the same activities. Do they have? Here's my question: Do they have the highest level of scrubbers and carbon filters and ventilation and recirculation that is sort of reasonably technically available at this time, some of the uh, nearby um, grow sites? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, uh, I don't know, I'm not keeping, uh, you know, up to date on the latest technology, but I do know it seems to be working. Um, because I also do periodic drive arounds, you know, um, just as a member of the community, you know, getting my coffee or whatnot, I'll, I'll definitely do some drive-bys. And if I'm in the neighborhood, I'll roll down my windows. And um, I think they must be using some good technology. 
um, and uh, Commissioner Ariaga might be able to to speak to that too. She's she's uh, got chops in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, I can definitely shed some insight on that, just even from my personal business. Um, I work with Pop and Barkley, and we have uh, an, an extensive HVAC system that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to install. Uh, we have a 10,000 square foot building that's right next door to Living Styles that uh, infuses a lot of our products, and you can't smell anything out of that building. A lot of uh, industry professionals all around Eureka have been in and out of so many facilities, and it's amazing the cost that's put into odor mitigation from all of these businesses and how serious they take it on um, you know a lot of these businesses had paid have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for their licenses hundreds of thousands of dollars and these are a lot of private small people who have put that type of sweat equity into their businesses and that's the last thing that anybody wants is to be a bad neighbor especially when you put so much into it you know these aren't easy businesses to build mm -hmm. um and as far as indoor cultivation goes just a, a comment you know there is a lot of you know large-scale farms on the market um especially outside of humboldt county there aren't a lot um of indoor cultivation sites uh throughout california there is um a lack of supply as you would say so there is a huge demand for this sort of business on uh, the value of the flower and the products that are made from indoor facilities stays really high consistently uh throughout the year which um is a really good vol um, value proposition like in the business side of things so you know they i think a lot of fears are behind like overproduction in this you know in that that space and we have yet to truly see it here in california um so that's just my my personal comment but yes it's like the odor mitigation from every business that i've been to and i've seen so many up i don't know 30 to 50 businesses within you know the city of eureka and surrounding areas and um, they take it very serious as does the city so i guess i have a sharper question is zero zero for odor is that possible or or in the case of a blackout and backup system without backup systems is there is there a scenario without going too far afield into a big earthquake or something or a big fire where where is it is that a reasonable expectation to have zero odor in these businesses we have a we have a little bit of insight on what the actual system is if you want to go for it. this is well, Jamie from the ground up construction um i helped to design the project and we called out all the um, equipment on the project we built over a thousand cultivation facilities in the last 25 years in humboldt county we know a lot about smell control um, our hvac system is specially designed for cannabis is made by accelerated growth solutions um, it includes a carbon filtration system, so any um, air that does leave the unit gets filtered through carbon filtration. Um, the units are built by Aon, specially built, who is a specialty HVAC manufacturer that manufactures medical equipment and equipment for schools. Um, the equipment also has a 0% leak rate, where standard HVAC equipment is allowed an 11% leak rate. Um, so the equipment that we're putting in is much higher grade than a normal HVAC system. That being said, the building construction itself, um, we're planning on using DPS panels. So the whole entire structure is going to be built out of freezer panels and be sealed up much better than traditional construction. Thank you. Also, can we get your name one more time for the commission? I, I missed it. Who was speaking? Buckland. Okay. Um, and, and in the staff report, the, I, I there was a you know, a, a snippet talking about negative pressure. Could you explain uh, your negative pressure facility and, and how that impacts odor? To yeah. the um, Great. That goes back to the controls that are um, built by the AGS, Accelerated Growth Solutions. They control all the pressures in the building. Um, so we're going to have negative pressures in all the hallways. Um, we're going to be um, venting all that air through carbon filtration, um, as well as scrubbing all that air inside of those areas. So we should have zero um, air leaving the building. So Commissioner Benson, to ask answer your question, you know, a little bit further, it's really hard for odor to escape when there's a, a really highly negative pressurized building, you know, 24 seven. And in the event of uh, powder hour outages and things like that, um, 
uh, do you guys have any uh, plans as far as generators and things like that for your, your facility? Yes, we, yes do. we do. We plan on an automatic transfer switch and automatic generator uh, starting system. Okay. Thank you. That answers my, my questions about the risk of, of, of odor and the backup plans. Thank you. Also, Commissioner Benson, to follow up on your uh, the first thought you had about uh, a lot of these businesses popping up and is this what we want, you know, for our city. Um, one thing to think about is if it is a boom and bust industry and if it if the industry does dry up, um, we're requiring all these applicants to go into these locations and if they spend over $50,000, they have to do what we uh, call spruce ups, you know, they have to take take the property and really do some improvements to it. So um, you could look at it as if, if the industry does leave town, we're going to have a really good you know, uh, selection of turnkey businesses. So that's a positive. It, help, help educate me a little bit as a new commissioner. It, uh, has there been some motion by city council where we have a, do we have a limit? Is there some end to the um, there, that we are going to be allowed as a commission to approve? We, we did put a cap on um, dispensary and currently we're not accepting any new dispensary applications, but um, we're in the process of doing a cannabis code update that's going to reopen that because after going through that process, the council feels um, that um, having a competitive business market would be a, a better solution. So that's going to be coming back online um, in the inland code somewhere or an inland section of town somewhere around August and then in the coastal zone a few months after sometime in the fall. Uh, but for the rest of the stuff, no, we don't have any caps. We're just doing a competitive business uh, market. Okay. Approach. I believe this is my last question. Um, you know, uh, indoor grows have high energy demands, and I'm and I'm wondering if, if as a as any kind of solar array been considered for the roof area of this particular proposal. Uh, I didn't see any on the plans, but. Uh, Does uh, anybody from the applicant group want to chime in on that one? Any it's a thoughts? point of curiosity, not a point of approval. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Devin and the gang, do you guys uh, have any uh, plans to someday maybe put some solar panels up on the roof? Solar panels, Jamie. I, at, maybe at some point. Right now, we're just trying to get through this process and do what we can do. But maybe in the future. And then I have a question for the applicants. Um, what what type of lights are you using? Um, are you planning on using in your facility? Uh, the grow lights specifically for your flower room. Gavita uh, thousand watt HIDs. HIDs. Okay. And we may switch to the LEDs. We're just not quite there yet in believing that they're a good replacement and they're sort of cost prohibitive as well. Yeah, they are cost prohibitive. Good LEDs use the same wattage as the HIDs, so there's really no energy savings in going to LEDs. Okay, thank you. So do commissioners have any other questions for um, the applicants or staff? Because if not, I'd like to open it up to public comment. I had a question for staff. Um, yeah, Riley, can you uh, explain the revocation process, the, the mechanics of it? Does it start with the complaint and then a workout with the applicant? And if you reach an impasse, does it move on to the planning commission and ultimately the council? Is that the trajectory? For a revocation of a permit? Um, I, I don't think we have to involve uh, council for, for revoking a permit. I believe uh, if we find just cause, we are, um, you know, it, it depends, Steve, because uh, every permit type, uh, oh, there's 12 different permit types. And, um, you know, for something like a dispensary, sometimes we go, uh, have to go and do inspections because uh, there's some broken windows or some burglary attempts. Um, so 
if an applicant is not, you know, we give them more of a, a leeway on that one. Um, but if it continues to be a problem, um, you know, it could could end up uh, being something where we look at revoking a permit. But to date, we haven't revoked any permits. Um, you know, a lot of permits have gone by the wayside just because people have um, not been able to perform on their projects and whatnot. But uh, we haven't, um, as far as I know, revoked any permits uh, due to any, any bad behavior. Uh, thanks. Uh, and, and I guess the reason I ask is because, you know, from my experience at the county level, revocation is a very um, cumbersome process and it requires quite a bit of due process to get to an outcome. And for that reason, it, it isn't really a good way to um, enforce regulations. It just isn't, it isn't nimble enough. But I am listening to what uh, Senior Planner Topolewski is saying about the history we have with the application we've already approved. I also know that it is totally possible to deal with odor control. It's well proven. The industry had to do that before it was legal <laughs> for other reasons. So um, it's not an impossible task. Um, I do have some concerns about the uh, energy use, but I'll reserve that for after we've uh, taken any public comments and. Uh, moved on from there. All right, so if there's no other questions uh, to staff or to the applicants, going once, twice. All right, and let's open up um, to public comment. <laughs> Mr. Kircher? Yes. Are you ready to go? Yeah. All right, you have three minutes and go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I was going to uh, address some various issues, but I had a chance to talk with Mr. Tobolsky this morning and got a better idea of what was written and required of the applicant that we, the residents and the general public, were not aware of. Nowhere in the document that's publicly available was the residential or tourism component of the neighborhood mentioned, and nowhere was there any mention of what mitigation factors uh, would be put into place or required of the applicant that we, the residents, were concerned about? And having talked to him, uh, I've got a better sense of that. And I was going to come on in my comments tonight, ask him to go through that, what we discussed this morning with the mitigating factors, which he actually has done before I requested it. So my only comment would be, um, I would further recommend the board that your boilerplate wording in the original public documents be changed to allow for room to be more specific on what has already been put in place and addressed, thus saving you and the concerned citizens the headaches of spending a major amount of time addressing and worrying over the impacts of such a project that have already been addressed to some extent. Um, and I still have some concerns related to the stench and feel that we should allow these grows in the industrial area zoning to protect residents and, and residents and businesses from any augmenting of, from the sites. Uh, this is how the cannabis grows are handled in the entire state of Washington. They're relegated to industrial uh, areas. Um, so I thank you, Mr. Commissioner Tobolsky, for going through um, what the applicant has already had. Um, and that's about um, the only issues I have, you know, to bring up between the board now. You've all got uh, copies of what we wrote and you've seen what uh, has been addressed. And I thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your time, Mr. Kircher. We appreciate you reaching out and, uh, and voicing everything that you wanted to discuss with us um, on the commission. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And if you'll stand by just a moment, I will get our second speaker on the phone.
So I have Ben Breckenridge on the phone with us and he has three minutes. Hi, commissioners. Thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time to hear my comments. I'm super excited to see Steve Lazar on. Steve, you've been an awesome planner to work with up in the county, and I'm glad that you're keeping an eye on this process. I just wanted to reach out because my neighbors in the Bridge District put this letter together, uh, raising some complaints around odor and some of the other issues that sound like they've been addressed. I just want to say thank you to the city and the planners for doing the due diligence that was required to bring this project forward. Um, and also really excited to see this project in the neighborhood. So if there's an odor issue, I'll be there with my neighbors protesting against it. And you guys will be the first to get a call. But it sounds like the uh, the process has been fully mitigated. And I'm glad to see another cannabis business coming into my neighborhood. That means more security cameras. It means more people in occupied buildings. And it means less tweakers in my neighborhood. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Breckenridge. Appreciate it. Commissioner Lazar, you already have a fan <laughs> doing good work. <laughs> Staff, is there uh, any other um, individuals that have shown up for public comment? No one else has requested to speak. Okay, well, if there's no one else there, then I would like to close uh, public comment and uh, bring it back to the commissioners. So um, in light of, of anything that was said, um, do you have any other questions for staff? Any other comments? I do have one comment that sort of dovetails with the last speaker's point about sort of encouraging appropriate use in the bridge district. It's kind of a strange, unique part of the city where there's, um, you know, a mix of residential and pretty heavy industrial use types along with some really incredible recreation opportunities. Um, I see on the whole, this project as being a real benefit. It's an existing industrial site that clearly needs a tenant uh, and it will bring in good activity, good eyes on the street. And it will also provide good jobs for probably mostly young people who will most likely use the trail and be out and about uh, and go to Old Town to get lunch. I think it will actually increase um, just the liveliness of that area. And I think the neighbors will come to actually appreciate their presence. I would like to address the first speaker's comments about their notices. I, when I read the letter, that was my immediate thought was like, hey, we, you know, the city's already um, dealing with the odor control as part of the code. And I'm just wondering if, you know, he has a point in the future, if you could in include that, like a link or somewhere they can find that because the, the code is public and something that they could read, but they might not know where to find it. But that, that definitely would have mitigated a lot of their concerns and issues around the project, I think, from the beginning. So that might that I think that's a true helpful comment from um, concerned citizen. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, when I was talking to Mr. Kirchick today, that's what I determined as well, um, that you know, we spend so much time addressing our findings, addressing the code and uh, the, the purpose of the code, but um, some of that language would go a long way. Uh, so that's what I told Mr. Kircher as well, that we're going to update our boilerplate language and include some snippets of odor control and a security plan uh, and maybe even something to do with waste removal. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, Planner Topolesky, I was going to just, add, you know, add to that, um, you know, as well um, to include, because uh, there were concerns about um, tail water, you know, what would happen with, with irrigation related water, you know, through, after it goes through the system, how, how that's treated, in, you know, any language that we have for that, any language about secondary containment of chemicals, you know, just so that all that's available to folks. Um, with a hyperlink would, would be really great because those seem to be the issues that come up. Thank you. I'll move the Planning Commission adopt a resolution with conditions approving a conditional use permit and a coastal development permit allowing indoor cultivation at 1735 2nd Street, APN 00205407. I will second that motion. And then if we could get a roundhouse vote so it's less confusing to see who all says what. 
actually, I have I have a comment and a and a request uh, for the commission. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thanks. Uh, so I noticed, uh, and I spoke with Riley earlier today to double check. Uh, I noticed there was no requirements for renewable energy use by the project. These uh, cultivation sites have huge energy footprints, and while I am completely supportive of seeing these types of projects emerge within city limits in places where the infrastructure is sufficient and you have access to services, I think uh, it, it is something that should be considered. Um, the state doesn't have a requirement this time. The county does. Um, the county requires 100% renewable energy for all indoor cultivation. And I'm interested in seeing whether the commission has an interest in requiring that of the applicant. I would point out that our local, um, plan from RCEA, our JPA that manages our power, has a goal of setting 100% uh, renewable local energy by 2025 anyway, so that the power you buy from them would be from renewable sources and a 100% renewable target to be all locally produced renewable by 2030. So if the offshore uh, wind emerges, that would be a part of this. Um, and the state whether we do anything at a local level or not, we'll be requiring zero carbon electricity by 2045, and that's through SB 100. Um, so to me, uh, approving a project without renewable energy requirements is really short-sighted and doesn't really look to the future that we have at a state level and the goals that we have at a local level in terms of our local energy use. So um, I'd be interested in hearing from the applicant and also from the commission as to whether they would be agreed to that requirement beginning from day one. Uh, but I did want to see a discussion on that. Commissioner Lazar, let me uh, give you my opinion on this. I, I'm behind you um, in terms of wanting to see renewable energy in a, in a high energy demand business like this. I'm, I'm reluctant to put that on the, on to make this particular applicant be the, the place we put our foot down. I would like to give the public, you know, a, at least a six month period to plan for that. And I, you know, I would really support doing that, um, you know, starting um, in in January of next year, so that so that pe people who are planning these kinds of businesses, who are already spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, have you know know to think about that in advance, rather than someone who's this far down the line already. Hi, I'm Jen Renwan. I'm the operations manager of this uh, facility, and I am perfectly fine with doing that. We are okay with that. Can you be clear what you're perfectly fine doing? The renewable energy, purchasing that, the green energy. For the record, it sounds like the applicants are willing to do it. Um, I would tend to agree more with Commissioner Benson that it would make more sense in my mind to do as part of cannabis regulations for the whole city, as opposed to starting by applying it to one particular application. Um, it just seems like it would be neater that way. I also um, concur with that, just also because last month, you know, we approved an, another project and so it's a more holistic thing. Um, Commissioner Lazar, I agree with you. And I think renewable um, energy is, is really important. Um, and just so many things it was looking like the state is moving that way with a lot of indoor growth facilities, which I'm relieved to hear, but I, you know, um, instead of doing the one off thing here, I agree with, uh, the other commissioners about making it a little more holistic. So, you know, people have time to prepare, but it's also just more of a fair thing to impart on our city. So um, in, in, in that vein, Commissioner Lazar, um, if you still wanted to move forward with that, that is a question I have for you, um, or if that's something that you agree with um, that we can you know, um, flesh out a little bit later down the road so it impacts more than just you know, starting in this place. Well, I appreciate your comments. Um, each of the commissioners, I, I certainly sympathize and I don't bring it up lightly. It's not fun to have those 11th hour um, types of requirements and it's much better to apply it at an ordinance level than at a project level. However, that being said, it is something that I will bring up with each project that we see with large energy footprints because 
I see it as an inevitability and really to um, prolong it is only to actually put applicants in a different difficult position down the line in my opinion but it won't affect my ability to support the motion on the table it sounds like the applicants already agreeable to utilizing renewable energy and I and if, if the commissioners aren't already aware it's really as simple as picking what tier you're in with RCEA. You don't have to do any investment beyond it's going to change your base rate and that will be seen in your monthly bill. So I, if, if the applicant's comfortable with it, I would just ask that uh, we incorporate that within our motion. It's not a requirement, but recognizing their willingness to include that with this project uh, from, the, from the beginning. Any other thoughts on that, commissioners? So staff, I have a question for you um, in, in that regards, um, talking about the motion and just having a, a little clause in that um, guidance on this, please. So if Commissioner Lazar is proposing to do what we normally refer to as a friendly amendment, he can make that recommendation and then the maker of the motion and the seconder would need to be willing to accept uh, both his proposed change. His other alternative is to just go ahead and make a motion to amend the motion that's on the on the floor. And then uh, if there is a second, you would vote on that motion first and then you would vote on uh, the amended motion. So Commissioner Lazar, what say you? Uh, I'm agreeable to either approach. I, I would like to see it uh, be a reflection of the applicant's choice. It's not a, uh, if we have confirmation from the applicant that they're willing to make that, a, incorporate that as part of their project, it's not a condition of approval. It's built from, it's coming from the applicant's uh, court. And uh, that would demonstrate the spirit in which I'm coming at this. I'm not looking to impose it as a requirement. I'm looking to see whether we can reach agreement that that's a reasonable target to begin from. So uh, I'd like to hear from the applicant, frankly, and if they're not willing to include it, then I'd say, let's leave the motion as it stands and, and then move forward. We're fine with including it. We currently do that out at our other facility, Humboldt County Indoors. I don't see any problem with it. And um, I, I say yes. Then it sounds like we need a friendly um, amendment to this. Um, would you like me to offer that? Uh, so I guess the friendly amendment would be to amend the motion to recognize the applicants uh, offer to include renewable energy as the exclusive power source for all cultivation related power demand and, uh, and, and make the motion reflect that that will be a, the project description for purposes of approval. So then, um, Commissioner Mayor, you would have to accept that? I accept that. And as the second, I accept that as well. So can we have a roundhouse, a roundhouse vote now? <laughs> Jessica, you want to call us off? Sorry, that's a roll call vote. Roundhouse, I figured y'all were just going to say it. So, <laughs> okay, please. Roll call vote. Got it. Uh, Commissioner Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Lazar? Yes. Commissioner Benson? Yes. Commissioner Freitas? Yes. And Commissioner Ariaga? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. Thank you, Jessica. Congratulations uh, to the applicants and I'm super excited to see what you do with the build out. Thanks for coming tonight and, and engaging with us. Thank you very Thank much you very for your much. time and consideration. Thanks Thank guys. You, so moving on to the next item, D on the agenda. Uh, the June 2021 zoning code update.
ball is in your court, Steph. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as you mentioned, the this is the June 2021 zoning code update text amendment. And this is the second modification to project number TA-19-0002. And the amendment is applicable in the inland portion of the city, which is shown on the map here. It's the colored portion uh, inside of the blue line. The proposed amendments generally include rectifying inconsistencies and errors, correcting grammar and clarifying lang language that is currently unclear or contrary or maybe confusing. The amendments are intended to, to maintain and ensure internal consistency throughout the zoning code itself. Um, the change to applicability of the zoning code is to require design standards apply to new construction in the SC zone district. And I'm ready with your questions. And uh, once uh, you've completed that, then I recommend that you hold a public hearing and adopt a resolution recommending that council approve. And there will be a motion available for your screen when you're ready. All right, commissioners, any questions to staff? Clarifications needed? Sounding like no one has any questions for staff. Yeah, Sorry. Oh, wait. Oh, Go ahead, I'll Commissioner Vincent. <laughs> um, uh, didn't we already um, uh, Principal Planner gets. Didn't we already give you some some input on this some months ago? This has not, not been before the commission previously. <laughs> I you may be remembering um, we came to you with a future cannabis ordinance. No, it was so. This is the zoning code update. Okay, I guess I do Correct. have just I've, I've got just a couple of minor comments. Okay. Um, uh, I. I liked all the revisions. Article two, uh, one and two, good revisions. Um, Article 3155.304.140, tree removal. Um, that subsection establishes permit requirements to remove trees in the res residential zoning districts. And um, and the 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 planning commission right before this one had, had just created some fresh language around this. A protected tree reads, a uh, 24 inch diameter or circumference of 75 inches as measured four and a half feet above the ground. There appears to be some inconsistency with that with the November 2020 minutes of the planning commission um, that uh, regarding revisions to this code specifically keep Eureka Beautiful responded with the recommendation to increase the proposed diameter of protected trees from 16 inches to 24 inches DBH. Wait, that's not inconsistent. Um, and this is reflected Oh, this is that is reflected in the in the update. You caught that, okay? Um, and five non-native deciduous trees and one new conifer appear to not have been added to the list of protected trees. There were only two deciduous trees, the black cottonwood and the red alder, um, on the list, and both are are native. Other native trees common to Eureka's greenways and gulches, um, not included in the list, are are three kinds of willow, Pacific wax myrtle, and coast live oak, and conifer species on the list of protected tree, trees that are native to California away from the coast, not, not native in this area at all, include um, Jeffrey pine, ponderosa pine, sugar pine, red fir, which is at 6,000 elevation, white fir, which is at 6,000 elevation, and western wine pine, pine that's at 8,000 foot elevation. So there's a number of trees listed that aren't really ecologically sound for this area. And so I'm, I'm wondering why they're on the protected trees list in Eureka. So they're on the protected trees list because this is the list that the that Keep Your Eco Beautiful recommended when they reviewed the ordinance. And that was last year during the June 2020 zoning code update. 
And yes, it is, it is different than what was in the planning commission minutes because the planning commission made recommendations to the city council that were ultimately not adopted by the council. Understood. It's just it it, it uh, you can understand why why it grates on on an ecologist and forester like myself to have basically out of range trees that would never grow at the coast on our list of the ones to be protected and ones that would grow here off the list of those to be protected. Um, I should I send this to you this this list or I I don't know how the how the planning commission would like to deal with this. I can't in all consciousness as an arborist say yes to this um, as as written so you could propose um, that the trees to be removed be removed and provide me a list of those and the trees to be added uh, be added and then if the planning commission agrees to that that would be the recommendation that would go to the city council and staff would look at whether or not um, we would make that recommendation or just say that the planning commission made that recommendation. Okay. So I should send this to you or share screen with the planning commission. Uh, what's the, what's the best action for me to take? So if you want the planning commission to uh, include your proposed changes in the update, then we probably need to talk with those uh, this evening so that they can take a look at what's being proposed. Okay. And if you have a share screen available, um, you should be able to do that. Okay. Um, let me see if I can. Okay. Sorry to be the problem child this evening, um, folks, but I'm just trying to do the job that I'm being asked. So you can see my screen now. Um, so the part that's relevant is is this. Let me just get down to. I'll make. I'll create a little space here. Okay. So it's really, it's really from here down. These are my these are my comments. The last two paragraphs. Trees, native trees that are common in Eureka's greenways and gulches, and I've walked in all of them, not included in the list, are as follows. These three willow species, Salix hookeriana, Salix lasiandra, Salix levigata, Pacific wax myrtle, Morelia californica, coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, are all in the gulches um, and native to the coast here specifically. And then conifer species that are on the list of, and those are not included in the trees that ought to be um, protected. Uh, then while some others are the black cottonwood and the red alder, which we also see in the greenways and gulches, it just seemed to be not include these 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 trees. And it's not that they're they're picked out just when they reach a certain size class that they're protected. And it's all trees that get to a certain size class. And then the the pines, the conifer species that are not in Eureka are are as follows. And they and neither are they in the keep Eureka beautiful street tree list of because because they drip sap and and drop cones on cars etc so i'm not on I, I i see these as irrelevant to the the greenways and gulches in eureka from a timberlands perspective and from an ecological perspective and those are ponderosa pine jeffrey pine sugar pine red fir white fir and western white pine and i've given you the elevations that they exist and they and they are not while native to California, not native to the coast. So I would strike those and add these. That's what I'm asking. And this is just my opinion. And I don't know how many of you have a, a biological background and whether, whether this just seems obvious to you or whether you want to hear uh, a certified arborist make this suggestion or, or, or something else. I, I, I don't know what, what level of comfort you need. Um, this is just my best professional judgment. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, we can discuss that more when we act, when we get to the discussion section after the questions are done. So I'm gonna hold comments for now. That's the only thing I saw in the zoning code update that struck me as needing revision. 
uh, I'll stop sharing. I, I guess I had a question for staff. Um, I'd, I'd ask uh, Kristen, what's the regulatory intent of the section that we're talking about, uh, Commissioner Benson? I listen, I, I take his comments, um, and I, I guess we're talking about 155.304.140 of the zoning code. It says protect and preserve trees that are important to the character of the city and its neighborhoods. And I would offer, I played softball, a doubleheader at Perigo Park in Blue Lake, and there's a giant sycamore tree, which is certainly not native to our area, but it has significance to that park and it conveys a certain feeling as far as the history and trees can do that whether they're native or not. And I guess I'm trying to see what the goal of this section of the zoning regulations is. Is it protective of trees regardless of their nativism or is it is it more about trying to get a list of species that are appropriate to our you know, biological area? Uh, Commissioner Lazar, the answer to that question is yes. Um, so originally the tree removal portion of the zoning code um, had a list of commercial trees and um, except for the additions that were made last time, the uh, trees in the list uh, were those commercial trees. So when we did the update in 2020, staff took a look at the tree removal ordinance and kind of asked the question, what is it that we're trying to do with this language? And um, staff came down on the side of part of what makes Eureka Eureka is the nice green areas that we have and the trees that we have, um, including you know redwood trees and, and those kinds of things. So we came up with the language um, change to instead of just regulating commercial tree removal to actually protect some of the trees. So the list of trees that's there now, um, again, was a combination of the commercial tree species that were listed originally and tree species that were recommended by Keith Eureka Beautiful. Um, I am certainly not a biologist. And so, you know, I would be happy to hear anybody's recommendations on the types of species that we should be protecting um, and would be happy to make those recommendations to council. My understanding, just to, if I can uh, answer Steve's questions or Commissioner Lazar's questions, these, the, it, wasn't in, it wasn't intended to be native or not native. It, it, it could also include ornamental trees that were of beneficial um, of you know seen as beneficial to to the city of Eureka, but it's interesting that they didn't pick the ma the majority. Those are the, the trees on that list are not the ornamental trees that people plant around Eureka. So it, it was really erroneous to me. If I go and tell you, I can quickly make you a list of ten trees that are not those that are the most common ornamental trees planted in people's yards and along the streets in Eureka, and it's not those. So it, it just seemed almost arbitrary, like somebody cut and pasted a list from somewhere without thinking about it. So to clarify, the list was not meant to be ornamental trees. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were trying to look more towards sculpting greenway trees. You know, I'm looking at the tree out my window here at City Hall. So those kinds of things as opposed to an ornamental tree that somebody might plant in their yard. Okay, thank you. Again, those wouldn't be, they, those, most of those trees wouldn't survive if planted in the gulches and greenways outside of constant care in somebody's yard. They're, they're just not ecologically fit for this area. And would quick, quickly become problem trees. They would become hazard trees if planted. Well, so um, following suit with that, um, I didn't have any other questions um, regarding, I mean, and, and Commissioner Benson, you missed a really heated planning commission session over trees previously. 
I think I was not expecting that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's not far out of line um, by any means. Um, and I, I would like, I don't know a lot about trees myself. So having an arborist around is, is quite um, helpful. Um, are there any other comments on this in particular or other comments to staff? I have comments, but not questions. So I'm assuming we're gonna take public comment, um, but then I do have some things before we make the motion. Okay, well, if anything else comes up, just know we have, you know, we'll kick this back to the commissioners again after um, so we can discuss further. Um, let's open it up to the public comment. So there was no one who asked to speak on this item. Okay. If no one is here, then we're going to go ahead and close public comment and we're bringing it back to the commissioners. So. Okay, I'm just going to jump in then and change gears. <laughs> but hopefully we'll come back to um, the tree discussion. So I had a couple of things that stood out to me that I wanted to um, get clarification on. Um, if I'm understanding these correctly. And I also did just want to th say thank you to staff for sending this out so far in advance. <laughs> so we really had the time to think through it. I, we do appreciate that for sure. Um, so the first one was this section that discussed um, the Spruce Up program, which I'm very much for. I know that um, Senior Planner Topolewski had mentioned it in the previous item. And the intent is to, um, you know, once you reach a certain threshold of cost, improvement cost to your property, there are certain improvements um, that are triggered. And my understanding is that this um, update would remove the annual adjustment for inflation. Um, which seems to me like it would essentially just lower and lower the threshold um, over time for when those improvements were triggered. Uh, and I wanted to, you know, get a better understanding of what the intent was there, uh, because it seems like accounting for inflation would keep the original intent, you know, the cost of that would be carried through time. So that's number one, I have two. So if staff would like to uh, discuss that, we could open it up for discussion. Sure, I'm happy to discuss that one. So staff's thought behind that was, the intent of the spruce up section is to bring properties that are not currently in compliance with the code into compliance with certain uh, portions of the code. So. Uh, for example, outdoor lighting or landscaping or uh, parking lot striping, amongst other things, uh, are the items that would be required to be updated if and when someone submits a building plan review with a construction value of over $50,000. Um, with the annual increase, Instead of well, this year, for example, we're at $53,045 as the limit after doing um, two increases since the code was adopted in 2019. So all of the people who are now submitting applications for building permits that uh, are at a level of 50000 or $51,000, they're not being required to do the spruce ups. So to me, it seems like we're going to miss opportunities in order uh, that we could have had to um, require the spruce up to, to bring more properties into conformance with the code. So that was just kind of the thought behind getting rid of the, the annual increase. Okay. Thank you. I guess that was sort of a question. <laughs> Um, and then the other, the other thing I flagged as, um, you know, something that I would like to hear the commission's thoughts on was, um, 
the signage required for pedestrian focused frontages, it seems like there would be a new requirement for um, additional design review, which would, you know, increase the cost and the time um, for new businesses, especially now, um, you know, with COVID, a lot of new businesses, a lot of turning over of businesses and a lot of challenges for businesses, it seems like um, not the not the best time to be adding more cost and trouble on to starting something new. Um, I think I'd prefer personally to leave it as it is. And then if it becomes an issue, we could address it in future. Um, so those were my comments and thoughts uh, for discussion. Thank you. So on that one, um, part of the reason for the proposed change is because it's not entirely clear whether or not signs um, on pedestrian focused frontage facades require um, review. And so as staff thought about it a little bit more, um, you know, just painting a sign onto the facade probably is not going to drastically change the appearance of the facade. but putting up a sign can or um, adhering um, a vinyl or a wood board or you know rectangle to the building um, has the potential I think to change the aesthetic of the facade especially if somebody chooses maybe to have it offset for some reason and kind of throws the balance of the facade um, out of kilter. So that's kind of where uh, staff is coming from with uh, proposing that change. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, commissioners? I have a comment while we're talking about, I think we were talking about the, the signage, but in particular, the non-conforming section, this is in every zoning regulations, non-conformities is, you know, just one of the central things that has to be worked through. And I'm a little concerned the language is written in such a way as to be so explicit to exclude other scenarios where there may be a non-conforming condition. So as 155.424.010, this is in Article 4. So as the section establishes regulations for site features, buildings, signs, that's the addition, uses, and lots. And then it goes in to say that we're a lot legally established prior to the code. I think it would be nice to have some wiggle room in there. And I'd ask staff whether or not that was deliberately excluded. So for example, there could be language to the effect of, you know, examples include but are not limited to site features, building signs and uses so that there are other scenarios whereby we can recognize legal non-conforming um, features. Um, has there, was there a deliberate decision to exclude that um, principal planner gets? I'm sorry, Commissioner Lazar, which portion of the section are you feeling was excluded? I'm looking at a, uh, Set, I'm looking at page 27 of Article 4. Um, I can share my screen if, if that would help. So the purpose section of the nonconformities? Yeah. It's like kind of a preamble to A, B, C, D, and E. Right. So the reason we added signs is because nonconforming signs is a section in this um, nonconforming section and it wasn't included in that list. Right, I guess, and, and I don't have any problem with that. I guess my question is, is, is there, um, it seems like this is so tightly written that it only allows for the four categories of scenarios, features, buildings, signs, uses, and lots, I guess five, but anything else that's not enumerated would be an open question, and I guess I'd, wonder if we might have some wiggle room in there for other scenarios that don't fall under one of those scenarios, I guess. 
So you're you're looking for an addition of language to say including but not limited to. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And so what would that list of including but not limited to include? Uh well, I, I'm, I, that's the whole thing is there, there could be other situations. I'm, I'm trying to think of some things that don't fall in that category. Um, maybe it, it, it's, uh, it's non-conforming with respect to the parking regulations, doesn't have sufficient parking to meet the code, or it's non-conforming with respect to, uh, you know, some performance standard that's required of new commercial uses that, you know, isn't restricted to one of those categories. So I guess there's a lot of ways that nonconformance can emerge with respect to the zoning regulations. And I guess I'm just wondering if this is the section that governs nonconformities, I'd be a little concerned that it's so tightly written, we wouldn't have any um, treatment of that. So specifically parking design and development standards for parking are excluded from this section or accepted? I mean, I'm happy to look at adding some other language. I'm just struggling to think of an example of something that either isn't accepted or isn't already included. So that's kind of why I was looking to you for an example. Yeah. Um, and if it's if it's if if nobody else shares my concerns, I'm happy to move on. I just uh, I like to have some of that wiggle room when it comes to these types of things, just because it prevents it from coming back. You know, as a as a question, I think it's a reasonable addition. I also can't think of anything off the top of my head, um, but maybe that's just because it's, you know, being sort of um, sprung upon us. I would be fine either way. I don't have a strong feeling. Well, just in speaking to that item, I, I don't have any good examples either. So <laughs> if we can't put things into words that make some sort of sense or reason um, for us and staff, I think that, you know, we have our answer there. And um, I find myself often in that place, though, where there's just some things that you want to add or, or change. And there, <laughs> it's just so it's so hard sometimes. <laughs> to come up with the specific language that would make sense or be a holistic process in it. So, um, Is this a place where we ask staff to make a recommendation that meets that intent and they come back to us with it? But didn't oh, staff, no. I think staff just asked though for a recommendation for wording on it. So <laughs> I think we're just in a catch 22. <laughs> Well, in the interest of trying to move us forward, I think what I would just offer, if, if we want to go with it, I would say the section would say, uh, except as otherwise provided herein, that would be a way to, to acknowledge things like the parking that you were talking about, Kristen, that are carved out for other areas. Um, and then that would, that would be the beginning of the sentence. And then in the middle of the sentence, um, after or before site features, building signs and uses, you'd say, including but not limited to, and then that would be it. And we'd and leave the rest as it's currently written. I'd have no problem adding that. Awesome. Getting quiet in here. So we resolve the tree stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> or resolve not to resolve it, one or the other. I don't think I don't remember there being a clear direction um, forward, but maybe I missed it. Was the intent to send the updated tree list to principal planner gets? and have that be the commission's recommendation. And then there would be some sort of research done on that list verification with Keep Rica Beautiful prior to the council hearing, is that correct? Except that this is what 
according to principal planner gets this is what keep eureka beautiful said ought to be in there and they you know and and the planning commission at that time didn't have anyone qualified to say yes or no to them about that Here, here's the big thing with it it's it's not it's, it's almost the trees don't matter but what we're saying is that these trees are ones that are protected and that you have to actually go through the process to get for them to get to a certain size and um, and and go through a process in order to take it down. So it's not that we're saying it can't exist in Eureka. We're saying it's actually protected such that you you have to get a permit to remove it um, if it's over a certain size, and that just doesn't make sense um, to me. The only the only real substantive thing I I had for Principal Planner gets on this was just that. Uh, is that the protected tree ordinance reads 24 inches in diameter, but the planning commission in November, because of uh, because of Eureka, keep Eureka beautiful, they decided on 16 to 24, and then that didn't get seem to get reflected. And either I don't understand why it didn't get reflected, and I know this went through city council also, so maybe they changed it. I thought I watched both commission uh, council meeting and the commission meeting, but. Um, the substantive thing is 16 to 24 inches DBH is the protected, is the proposed diameter of protected trees that came out of this commission and I thought was certified by the city of Eureka um, council. And then that's not what I read in under F in the, in the article three. So it just said 24 inches. So that's the only, that's the one thing that I think has to be clarified. And then the choice of trees is, is a separate, is a side issue from that of trees to be protected and not protected. So in June 2020, staff recommendation was that the um, diameter of the tree be reduced to 16 inches. Okay. And um, the planning commission looked at it. Uh, they thought it should be much larger than that. Mm -hmm. And then Keep Eureka Beautiful recommended the 24. So when we went from 16 to 24, that was not a range. It was changing from being a diameter of 16 inches to a diameter of 24 inches. Okay, thank you for clarifying because I read all this stuff and I and I saw stuff that seemed to be not consistent. That's that's the only reason I brought it up. Yes, and just for clarity for the new um, commissioner, so you're making a recommendation to council as to what you think should be included in the text amendment. When staff takes it to council, we provide your recommendation to the city council, but sometimes we will say, staff doesn't recommend really council that you do this, and here's why. Or we will say, staff has no comment on, you know, whether to add or not add this. Or we will tell them if we support the recommendation. So just so you're aware, um, everything does go to the city council. It may not come with a recommendation from staff. Okay, so so the recommendation that I would like this body, the planning commission, then to consider is is this is this list of trees of of adding three native trees that if they get over twenty four inches in diameter, um, that they become protected at that point, and they are ones that that I assure you are all over Eureka's greenways and gulches and in people's yards, and that we remove these one two three four five six conifers that are really taken from the Sierra Nevada, starting at 1,000 feet to elevation 8,000 feet, and that's their range. And if they grow here, they will never get to that size. So it's, it's almost like, and if they do get close to 16 inches, they'll start to fall down. They won't live their entire life um, because this climate is not right for them. So it, it, it makes no sense to have them on the list as protected trees. They won't live to the age to get to that size without first becoming a hazard tree is basically what I'm saying. I have no issue with taking trees that won't thrive here off of the list or at least providing that to the council. Um, I would be more hesitant to add more trees. It's not that I'm against willows, for example, but I'm not sure that I personally have an interest in, you know, having a permit process for their removal. 
unless you know they're part of a coastal wetland area in which case they are protected anyway is my understanding so just wanted to throw that out right sure uh, all, what i'm saying is that these are the ones that exist here already and get up to that size and seem consistent with the ones that they chose which was red alder and black cottonwood to protect anyway we we could split hairs about the science of trees for a long time. I don't want to waste any any more of your, of your time because, as we all know, red alder don't get they they typically fall down before they get that big anyway. It's kind of even a waste to put that on there, anyway. Uh, so, I how would you like me? Would you like me to send this to Principal Planner Gets to make these changes or? What what would you like me to do as a commission with this observation that I have? Um, I don't I don't have a problem with adding to the list, uh, and it sounds like the ones that you were you were targeting for removal are kind of self regulating in that they won't successfully make it to the diameter if we stay at 24 to ever be something that would be protected mm -hmm. so um it's not that i do it is a little bit confusing to me the the lists and its kind of purpose I, I, it, it it really is hard for me to divine so I'm, I'm a little nervous about removing stuff at this point um but i am willing to entertain especially native trees that can reach a certain diameter um, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that they, they can have significance to neighborhoods and the, the landscape. So I'm open to adding, um, and, and I would ask if, if Commissioner Benson is okay with just leaving the ones that are on there, given that they're not likely to either be around here or be successful in the long run. Yeah, sure. If that's if that's what folks want to do, I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, let me just give you tell you it makes us look to me. It's my it's my pride in Eureka. It makes us look silly. It's like we gave if we gave a fishing license and said if you get a swordfish over forty feet long, you can't you you know it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? First of all, we're not going to catch a swordfish in in the ocean off here, and it's not going to get you know that big, right? So it's it's sort of like anyone who's in the know will look at this and just go, "Wow, they don't know what they're talking about in that city." So it's just a pride thing. Appears I'm the only one who feels passionate about that. And so if, if no one feels passionate about it, I can let it go. This is a team sport. I think passing on that information to council would be the most appropriate uh, choice. I don't know if it needs to be part of our motion or recommendation. Okay, well, that's what I'll do. I will send it to to Kristen, as written, as a comment. Thank you, Commissioner Benson, for your passion. I respect it, I do. Um, I just don't know enough about trees to really weigh in heavy or not. So I, I think it is appropriate though that you send it and that council hears you as, as well. Um, but passion is a good thing. <laughs> any any other points to discuss um on this for staff any other questions i had one question about uh article three section the parking requirements and just the basis um what was the reason for the change it, um in terms of i see there's a section here 155 point, so this is page uh, 50 of Article 3 um, in the residential use exemptions, uh, Part B, Section 5, where five or more new units are created, parking must be provided only for the units in excess of four. Is this a, a housing element uh, implementation, or what was the point for this additional language? So the 
paragraph right above that that applies to the downtown DT and downtown West DW and also the Hinge Industrial Zone District, which is HN. Um, it has language in there that just clarifies that if you're doing nine or more units, then you have to provide only for the units in excess of eight. And that language was not included in the language for the other zone districts where the four are um, excluded. So I just wanted to add that for clarity. It's come up a couple of times with um, staff and developers asking. Thanks. So as it stands, um, and I got a little bit lost in the weeds um, in there. So staff, um, what changes are we actually moving forward with tonight so far? Have there been any that we actually are putting into language? I haven't heard any yet. Okay. Discussions about things, but not. Um... Just making sure I'm on the same page. Yeah, they would need to be included in a motion, so. Okay. It sounded like there was support for Commissioner Lazar's <clears throat> um, recommendation. If you wanted to move that forward as a motion, Steve, that'd be up to you. Sure, I mean, if, if no one has any problem with those clarifications for the non-conforming provisions, I would ask Principal Planner Getz to make sure that she was able to catch the gist of the, the edits. And if so, then to just incorporate that in the package that we've already been discussing, Articles 1 through 5. And I would second that if, if that's the motion. I'll make that the motion. Great, I second it. Any other comments before we have um, a roll call vote on this? All right, Jessica. All right, Commissioner Lazar. Yes. Commissioner Benson. Yes. Commissioner Freitas. Yes. Commissioner Mayer. Yes. And Commissioner Ariaga. Yes. Thank you, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so, um, Moving on, my agenda packet is frozen on my screen. <laughs> I don't think there's enough internet around here to house a lot of these meetings. <laughs> so staff, can you, wait, hold on, it's popping up. So we do need to have um, a motion to adopt the resolution to make the findings and I will amend the resolution um, and the text of the amendment to include Commissioner Lazar's non-conforming language. And if there are any other changes that are included in um, the motion, then this would be a great time. So Kristen, are you looking for someone to be reading this motion? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'd be happy to do it. I move. The Planning Commission adopt a resolution making the findings required to approve a text amendment and I further move we forward a recommendation to the City Council to adopt the proposed June 2021 zoning code update with the modifications as discussed this evening. I will second. And if we can have roll call votes. Oh. Yeah, if I can remember everybody's names, Commissioner Lazar? Uh, yes. Commissioner Benson? Yes. Commissioner Freitas? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Ariaga? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. Kristen, can you leave it up for a second so I can finish? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We'll get it tomorrow. Okay. You're quick on the draw, Jess. 
quick on the draw. <laughs> All right, well then that would be um, wrapping up our public hearings, um, moving on to business. Um, I don't believe we have any old business. Correct me if I'm wrong, staff. We do not. Um, we do have some new business though. Um, to look over the Reagan resolution. And we would be looking either for a motion to adopt the resolution or to modify it. I'll make a motion that we adopt the resolution, um, the Reagan resolution as written. It was beautifully written, I thought. I'll second that. I thought it was really nice as well. Roll we'll call vote then. Yes, please. It's so much easier on this. <laughs> okay, figured out what to call it. We can just keep going. All right. So, um, Commissioner Lazar. Yes. Commissioner Benson. Yes. Commissioner Freitas. Yes. And Commissioner Mayer. Yes. Commissioner Ariaga. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Cheers. <laughs> and then um so i had a question about the service resolutions but i guess i could take that just offline um with staff um you know just typically what the protocol is um once they're adopted they're just signed in and then that's it yeah, so what we'll do is we will assign a resolution number to this tomorrow. And then um, when oh, we'll update the title on it too, since it says vice chair, we'll change that to chair. And then when you're available to sign the resolutions from this evening, um, this will be included for your signature. And in non COVID times, we normally have all of the commissioners sign it, but because of COVID, uh, we're just having the, the chair sign. Okay, thank you for the information and the education. I appreciate it. Um, moving on then to reports and communications, uh, directors um, reports and communications, housing on publicly owned sites. So just wanted to give you an update on a couple of things that are going on. Um, link housing, so for development on the sites at Sunny and Myrtle, 8th and G and 6th and M. Um, they held a community input session for um, infrastructure and transportation. Um, and I believe the invitation was sent to all or was emailed to all of you. Um, that was on April 27th, I think it was. Um, and then they released a survey uh, which uh, they sent out and we also included that on the city's website and it just asked some questions about riding the bus and uh, using trails and uh, using bicycles for transportation. The survey closed uh, yesterday at 5 p.m. and tomorrow at 6 p.m they will do, be doing another community meeting to provide the results of that survey to um, the public. So if you haven't already um, registered for that, or if you need a link to register for that, just let me know and I can get that to you. Uh, on, looking at my calendar here, on May 18th, a week from tomorrow, the council will be considering adoption of a resolution um, for linked housing to submit their application uh, for funding for um, not only development of the three sites, construction on the three sites, but also um, the infrastructure improvements, which um, are being narrowed down and, and shaped by the meeting and the survey and then um, staff and link will be making a final determination as to what those infrastructure uh, improvements will be that are included in their application. We're also working on um, putting together the RFP for the next go around of 
housing on publicly owned lots. Um, according to the housing element, um, the lot locations are 3rd and E Street, 4th and G Street, and 5th and D Street. So 4th and E Edward, or sorry, 3rd and E Edward, 4th and G George, and 5th and D David. Um, and we decided to go ahead and hold um, some public meetings and with the intent of inviting um, property owners and business owners that uh, were within 500 feet of the locations where the development was proposed to occur. Uh, we held those meetings over three nights last week. Um, needless to say, the uh, property owners and business owners were not uh, wholeheartedly supportive of having the development be located on basically any of those sites. Um, prior to the meeting, the city manager had decided that we would um, skip the lot at 3rd and E Streets and also the lot at 4th and G Street and put those on the RFP for next year. And instead, we would do development on the uh, City Hall parking lots, which are at uh, the corner of 5th and K Street and 6th and L Streets. As of today, we are continuing to look at um, the possibility of swapping out for the 5th and D Street site um, and substituting another site that's not yet been determined. So, we are going to be talking with um, the State Department of Housing and Community Development tomorrow to talk about uh, whether it's even possible for us to switch out sites, whether we can um, put off lots from this year to next year, even though the housing element says we're supposed to do them this year, um, and whether or not we can reallocate units to other sites and how we can do that. So um, at our next meeting next month, um, I should have more information for you on where that goes and what lots were finally decided on. The ultimate goal is to get the RFP out by July 1st. I'm not sure at this point in time that that's going to be able to happen, but uh, I'm still going for that goal and we'll get it done just as soon as we possibly can. So happy to answer any questions if I can. Um, yeah, how many people were engaged um, when asking like other business owners, just the ballpark? So I believe the mo most we had was on Thursday evening, um, which was for the 4th and G Street lot. I think we had 74 uh, participants. That does include council and staff. Um, and not all the council was there, just a couple of them. But um, we had well over 60 at various points in the evening um, for those meetings. Yeah, and I guess, well, and we can probably discuss next month. Um, I, I'm just curious you know, what the most, like, can, what was the largest, like, issue with it or the largest point of contention for people? The loss of off-street parking um, or the replacement of parking within 300 feet of the site. So originally, um, let me back up one more step. So when we took the RFP for the sites that were ultimately uh, awarded to link housing uh, to the city council, we asked them at the meeting, um, do you want to require a developer to maintain the parking that's on the site or do you want to allow them to reduce or fully remove the parking? And um, in order to try and have the best opportunity for responses from developers. Uh, the council decided to leave that open and let the developers decide what it, what they wanted to do about uh, proposing parking or removing it or whatever the case may be. Um, for this go around, we are going to be requiring, assuming that we still end up with the three lots that I mentioned before, we're going to be requiring that the developers either maintain the existing amount of parking on the site or that they replace it within 300 feet of the site. And I think there's a third option too where they maintain some of the parking on the existing site and then move some of it to a, another site within 300 feet. 
So ultimately there would be no net loss of parking over and above what is currently required. However, as a lot of people um, pointed out and they are absolutely right, the, um, the housing uses them, uses themselves are going to potentially create um, more parking demand. And if they're not providing parking for those dwelling units, then those dwelling units are going to end up parking either in the available parking that then takes up the parking that's available for surrounding businesses or um, they're going to be parking on the street. So the possibility certainly exists that they can get their parking requirement for their developments down to zero. And there's a couple of different ways that they can do that. Um, they can use the exemptions or um, exclusions that are in the zoning code. So for example, if they provided bus passes to um, each one of the apartments, then there is zero parking required if everybody gets a bus pass. Uh, the other way that they could do that is they could apply for density bonuses and use um, incentives, concessions, or waivers to reduce parking requirements um, down to zero. So the possibility exists that there would be no parking required for the dwelling units themselves. But again, we were going to require that they maintain at least whatever parking existed on the site. Sounds like this is going to be a, a, a fun one to dig into further. <laughs> I just want to take a minute to thank staff too for <clears throat> pushing this forward. You know, it is really important um, and it can be challenging and also just being willing to be flexible as well, you know, pushing it forward, but also being receptive to changing direction. I think that's a good balance. Um, and, you know, counting up the days, it sounds like principal planner gets has been in night meetings. Um, at least from six to eight for four out of the seven evenings this past week. So thank you for your continued service. <laughs> wow. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Friedis. There was also a council meeting in there. <laughs> Staff, you're the real champions here. Thank you for your tireless work. Thank it's you. a lot. So. When, when is this likely to come across our desk? Or... Uh, in front of this board? It actually will not come before you. There's no requirement um, or procedure for the Planning Commission to review the RFP. I know Commissioner Reagan um, was not comfortable with that. Uh, that was um, part of his issue. But it's the City Council's RFP, and they're the ones that um, determine whether or not what staff has put forward uh, is going to go out in it or not. So. Um, I will do my best to let you know when things are happening and feel free to let me know at any point in time if you have any questions or if you want me to add something onto the agenda so that we can talk about it. I would just like to say just for a point of reference that when this came to the Planning Commission and, and when it was presented to us, um, the parking was going to remain. The, the point of the project was parking would remain on the bottom floor and that the apartments would go up top. Um, and so I, I'm surprised that that changed after it left the council, but that's not totally unusual that that happens. But just for some historical reference for the new commissioners to let you know that, that that's how it was presented to us. And I think that that's how we assumed it would be going forward. Definitely. Lots of points of, of clarity there. And thank you, Commissioner Mayor, for sure. Um, it was interesting to see the diagrams when this was uh, presented, you know, and, and talking about housing and how it would be structured. And, um, you know, and just from the perspective of areas being in tsunami zones, the idea of parking structures being underneath, um, we're actually, it was kind of cool to see that idea. And I am kind of sad to see some things change, but um, yeah, development woes, I guess, and, and trying to get people to do bids for the city, um, as staff was reporting. So thanks for keeping us uh, apprised of all this, and I'm sure we'll have more questions as things develop. Um, it's nice to, you know, at least hear what's going on with it. Um, so there's no other um, 
director's report to communications, correct? I have nothing else for you this evening. Thank you. Um, any final comments from the commission? <laughs> Well, um, I guess the last um, item is adjournment. So I just, again, I wanna thank all of you for being here and, and, and thank you for making this as painless as possible. I know a lot of this stuff is kind of hard to get into, but it's really great to see peers in this community um, caring and, and actually really wanting to be here. So thank you. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you, Commissioner Ariaga, nice to see you. Thank you everybody.